Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Well, joining us now in our studios in Hong Kong for a discussion about inflation and deflation is Wei Yao, head of research and chief economist for the Asia Pacific at Societe Generale, CIB. Wei Yao, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the data we'll get this morning. In about 20 minutes or so, 17 to 20 minutes, we'll get the PPI numbers and the CPI numbers for the month of March. Still expecting uh, a negative number on PPI, minus 2.8% is the survey estimate. CPI, though, uh, should show an increase of 0.4%, and that would be the second consecutive month of being in positive territory. Can we take that as a wee bit of good news? Well, maybe it's just a wee bit of good news. But I think structurally, things haven't really changed much. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the economic situation in China, it continued to be a challenge of not enough domestic demand and a lot of supply. So this, uh, and the policy, on the policy front, there is not much uh, significant to address this issue. So when you're dealing with deflation, particularly at uh, the factory gate level, the wholesale level, what's the remedy here? I mean, is there a way to kind of uh, give maybe a little bit of guidance to policymakers in China on a way that they could uh, arrest this situation? Well, there is a lot of focus about China's overcapacity issue. Um, I I agree, you know, China does uh, have so much supply. However, uh, I would think the problem lies in more of a lack of domestic demand in the sense that, you know, China, because of the housing crash, is losing a big engine of domestic demand. Um, And uh, the policy is very much tilted towards supply. So I think it's a matter of uh, balancing the policy more towards demand rather than supply. So we're trying to get Chinese consumers spending again. And a moment ago, you said you kind of referred to Chinese policymaking as substandard almost. Well, it's uh, unbalanced, I would say, because it's pretty clear what they want to achieve for good reason. Because, you know, I think uh, the the idea here of the top leadership is to uh, boost the productivity growth by, you know, moving China up the value chain. However, you know, it's, um, it may not be entirely the remedy here, given that we are in a deflationary environment. And if China continued on supporting supply, it's going to cause trade tensions, which we're already seeing. Yeah, that's a little confounding. I mean, you talked about the overcapacity issue. And then when you listen to what the government is saying, that industrial policy will be the way of reviving economic activity. It doesn't really make sense, does it? Well, it's just that they have a long-term view that this is where, this is where China should be. Um, and it seems that there's not much willingness to adjust to the reality that, you know, they have this deflation problem at hand, or maybe they don't worry about this as much as we do. I think, you know, it's just going to take a more convincing to, uh, to make them at least change course. Right now, the export momentum seems to be picking up, so it doesn't seem to be the time yet. Yeah, if you look long-term... Okay, you're thinking industrialization, building up tech, the chest is stuck out. But then short term, you're thinking, hey, we got to get this economy moving again. How do you stimulate consumers to get them spending? Well, there there were one thing they talked about, which got us a little bit excited, is uh, subsidizing, you know, the replacement or upgrade of home appliances. However, we haven't heard much uh, follow up, at least, you know, what we really need to see is government actually providing tangible amount of fiscal support to households, either on the consumption side or income side. Another path to the long term sustainable growth of consumption is obviously to beef up the social security system. But that, again, is is a slow moving process. When you look at the tension between the U.S. and China right now, particularly in areas of high technology, I mean, the the barriers that have been established, export controls, limiting China's access to some of the most sophisticated high-tech technology. Are are you sensing that this is having a meaningful impact on the economy, or is it something we only talk about uh, kind of marginally? It is not too obvious yet, but uh, I I suppose, you know, this does 
indeed limit um, put some limits on China's uh, development in terms of you know AI. All right. Um, you know, and I think one consequence, one clear consequence from all these U.S. policy is actually making China, making the Chinese policymakers even more, want to double down on the supply strategy more. Uh, so you see, this is the response the Chinese leadership is coming up with towards the U.S. Maybe we could think of if the U.S. were to relax, be more relaxed about China and China would be more willing to rebalance. Who knows? We're seeing more efforts to try to stimulate uh, the housing market. Uh, we have a leading newspaper this morning, The Economic Observer in China, uh, saying that many Chinese cities now are, are cutting uh, or they're doing some targeted easing here. Fifteen cities have removed the lower limit for mortgage rates on first, first-time home purchases, and some four cities have relaxed housing provident fund policies. Can they do more? Well, they can do more, um, certainly. Uh, but I, gu- I guess, you know, one short-term problem for them is they really need to address uh, the, the issue that developers do not have the trust of households to finish projects. Uh, and and if this problem can be addressed, I believe some of the demand could, could come back because you look at the sales of uh, finished uh, apartments, they're pretty decent. Uh, it's it's the other part, which the unfinished part, you know, it's really, really distressed. But ultimately, you you know, it's it, it's it, it's a market um, force, right? The prices probably may need to fall a bit more for the households to be more willing to come back. Because if you look at the affordability of the housing prices in the big cities in China, it's very hard to say they're cheap enough. Next week, we get the monthly activity data. Is there something that you're looking for that could represent a, a big surprise, something maybe that the market is not prepared for? Or do you think market participants have a pretty good understanding of what's happening on the mainland uh, insofar as the economy is concerned? So data-wise, I think the the, the, I, the expectation or kind of the consensus here is, you know, cyclically things are not getting worse, at least. There is a bit of improvement on the supply side, industrial side, slow progress on the consumption. Uh, if anything, the positive surprise, if any, uh, will be, you know, the consumption data, the retail sales. But the downside risk is if, if the supply side also lose momentum. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case yet. So if we look at the Chinese economy, Wei Yao, and think about external inputs versus internal, you know, domestic consumption, which will perform the best over the next six months and which really holds the key uh, to getting the economy really roaring again? Uh, so our expectation is that the external demand will improve. As we can see across Asia, you know, the trade momentum is really picking up. Uh, so that will help China, too. Domestic, our assumption is, you know, consumption, income, uh, it's uh, it continue its very gradual pace of recovery. Housing may only find a bottom uh, by the end of uh, this year if the policy keeps at it. What about um, the labor market, particularly where uh, younger people are concerned? Well, so that's going to be a derivative of, of all these forces. Essentially, you know, we, we don't have big positive force to uh, to improve the labor market uh, very fast because jobs are not generated by the manufacturing sector, you know, in terms of the majority of the jobs. It has to be the service sector doing better. But the service sector is, you know, has uh, challenges, yeah, and, and things don't change fast. We just had the PBOC keep the fix steady to support mm-hmm. the yuan after this big jump in the dollar. Just 20 seconds or so. Do you like the way the PBOC is managing the currency? Um, the PBOC is, uh, you know, I would say it seems that the thinking here is they don't want too weak currency. Um, mm. They sort of throw a little bit test to the market once in a while to see, you know, if they weaken the fix, what happens? And it seems that what happened was not what they liked. Yeah. So, so, t- so it doesn't seem that there will be willingness to devalue the currency yeah. to yeah. generate okay. inflation. Yeah. All right, Wei Yao's with us, head of research and chief economist for the Asia Pacific at Societe Generale. Joining us now in our studios in Hong Kong is Stephanie Holtz-Jen, the Asia-Pacific CIO at Deutsche Bank, for further discussion about markets. 
So I think the contrast is very interesting, very compelling, something to talk about. A very hot inflation reading, Stephanie, in the United States, a very cool inflation reading in China. Yet, both countries are very much right smack dab in the middle of global supply chains. How do we make sense of that? Well, it's been a dynamic that is around uh, with us for a while, and I think uh, the explanation goes way back to the way um, the reopening after COVID has been handled. So I'm not sure I'm adding uh, much news here, but um, I think the unfortunate part is that the uh, macroeconomic data in China keeps on um, being uneven. So we had a set of fairly uh, optimistic data when we saw the PMI swing back into, you know, expansionary territory just slightly so. And then, uh, you know, other readings are still coming in below expectations. So it's something that uh, needs to be taken into account as one assesses the investment opportunity. We look at it as a second half of the year opportunity in China. We had a tactical trade on, and I think we need to be careful um, and, and stay on the sidelines for the time being because we don't have the whole mix of macroeconomics, sentiment, and the following flow yet uh, all showing in the right direction. So many of the guests that we have on this program, when they talk about the, the problem at its core is just the absence of positive sentiment. And, you know, when you don't have consumer engagement in an economy and you don't have domestic demand, I mean, there are ramifications for that, right? Is there a policy prescription that you can think of that might improve the behavior of the consumer in China? I think um, there's been a lot of um, policy efforts to support the consumer uh, sentiment. So we have seen a lot of fiscal stimulus quite targeted as well in terms of stimulating the consumer to not just save, not just repay loans, but go and invest um, and uh, purchase uh, in the economy. But it's it's still underwhelming, as we've seen recently in the retail sales data um, as well. So, But in terms of the market opportunity, of course, it's twofold. There's an international investor sentiment that I think is still, um, you know, needs more to be convinced. And I, I, I took that stance um, and again, Again, I mentioned that technical trading opportunity that uh, we saw and then moved to the sidelines about one and a half weeks ago when we saw the government weakening the currency with the, um, with the uh, less uh, positive fixing, mm-hmm. which I actually interpreted as a sign of confidence from a Chinese perspective. But the market, but it was the market not response. at all. Yeah. Exactly. It sold off yeah. right away. I remember that comment so clearly. It was a couple of weeks ago and you were in Singapore. And, yes. and the reason we have you back now is you're here in Hong Kong and it's great to get you into our studios. I remember um, you, you're not that positive on China, but that you were pretty positive on Japan and India. Let's start off with Japan. Uh, Significant weakness in the yen this morning and threats from policymakers. Uh, Are are you still really confident in the upside uh, possibilities in Japan? So the Japan investment opportunity, whether that is the structural angle to it because of the government, you know, the reforms around um, the Tokyo Stock Exchange that will improve governance, as well as the cyclical uh, elements that drive the market higher, which is the weekend that you just mentioned, these are still remaining intact. Of course, we have to be absolutely wary about uh, the Ministry of uh, Finance ability to change the course of the currency. But I also remain of the opinion that it's a double edged sword. Um, for the Japan, J- the Japanese authorities to really intervene. And I think this is also why we are seeing this being on a verbal um, tune. And that is also why the market is not really um, uh, taking its clue and going uh, meaningfully the other way. So I think what they are doing is um, they will be verbally um, intervening uh, to slow down the depreciation, but it will be very difficult to change the course because it is, is, is benefiting an export-led economy. It's yeah. benefiting the investment opportunity in an overall slowing growth environment. So I think it's prudent to have this run for a little bit more. So I think we can agree yeah, that a weekend would be positive for the exporting companies. But Prime Minister Kishida is in the U.S. today. And one of the things that was unveiled at the White House in a joint press conference with President Biden was this investment, this program for to drive innovation in terms of artificial intelligence. And when I think of AI as it relates to Japan, that's really not an export story, is it? Is that an opportunity for you? Do you want to put money to work in AI related companies in Japan? Well, we're looking at this in the context also of the alliances that Japan has been forging around the semiconductor space, you know, um, and, you know, just enlarge this into more the IT. Mm. And now you're talking about AI uh, conversation. I think that's a, is an important um, 
you know, alliance that's been fostered and definitely is an investment pocket in a sector that needs to be looked at. It is, uh, it it is not benefiting of the weak yen necessarily, but, you know, another sector is, for instance, it's tourism. You know, everyone still in Hong Kong, everywhere I go in Asia has a top destination, Japan, because of the weak yen as well. So there are many different elements to why the yen weakness can run. Yeah, and I know that you're still positive on mega cap tech in the United States, so we don't have time to get into that now. Uh, but um, even with, uh, you know, these uh, sort of sticky levels of inflation that we're seeing. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining us in our studios. We'll talk again soon. Stephanie holtz Jen, APAC CIO at Deutsche Bank. Well, joining us now for some discussion of the same is Lindsay Piegza, chief economist at Stiefel. So, Lindsay, it does seem sort of a slam dunk, I would imagine, uh, that June is off the table. However, there will be a considerable amount of data that we get between now and then. How are you looking at rates here over the next uh, month or two? Well, I think given the the baseline for the economy, growth accelerating beyond expectations, a, a still very spendy consumer, a labor market slightly less tight than it was, but still very tight. This is further justification for the Fed to remain on the sidelines at the current policy level. And so our base case remains, as it has since the turn of the calendar year, that the Fed will wait until the second half of the year before initiating rate cuts. Now, with inflation reversing course as of late, I, I do think it's going to be difficult for the Fed to justify anything beyond one or two rate reductions. And even so, after initiating that pathway, if we fail to see meaningful improvement, we could see a second round pause after that. So the Fed moving back to the sidelines after just 25 or 50 basis points of cuts. Uh, you have to remember, too, last Friday's employment data was very, very strong. We were 100,000 above forecast in terms of uh, non-farm payroll growth, I think. Initially, we went into the data with a number of around 200K. We came out 300K. Is there a risk, in your view, that we could see another hike there is, uh, but that scenario has to be very specific. I would need to see inflation reverse course in a meaningful way and in a persistent manner. So we would need to see a continued upward trajectory, really forcing the Fed uh, into a corner in order to re-engage, in order to continue with hikes. Right now, with the inflation level just ticking slightly higher, I don't think that's enough to scare the Fed into further rate hikes. But again, it does justify further position on the sideline. You know, slightly higher inflation is not good news to low income people, and it's not good news for the housing market or for small companies that have uh, floating rate loans. Uh, but it, it may not have a huge effect on company earnings. And if we don't see that, then we'll probably see, um, in, you know, labor staying relatively strong with companies. And so ultimately, I mean, is this a good news story or bad news story for for the, the economy? Well, it, it, it really depends. But my biggest concern is right now that the U.S. economy appears to be resilient. That being said, momentum is clearly waning. Consumers are still spending. Businesses are still investing. But they're doing so at a noticeably reduced pace. So activity has already gone from 5 percent in the third quarter to 3 percent at year end, likely a 2-ish percent pace in 2024. But where do we go from here? If growth continues to slow to a non-accelerating pace, or at least fall below the bare minimum that we should expect for a developed economy, but the Fed is still sitting on the, the sidelines, twiddling their thumbs, allowing inflation to remain above target, well, well now they've backed well, us into you know, a very it's, dangerous it's, I don't, I don't think you can scenario. Say you can't really say twiddling their thumbs because, you know, we have to say they were very aggressive in getting the Fed funds rate up to five and a half percent. That's well above where inflation is now. And it's well above the norm. So it's not like they're sitting on their hands, really. It's just that they're holding at very high levels. Well, I would argue that they were they had a hyper focus on achieving a soft landing. And with that focus, I, I think they failed to raise rates to a sufficiently restrictive level. When we look at cycles historically, the Fed typically has to raise rates above the peak level of inflation. This time, they arguably stop short at 5%. And so I am concerned that the Fed has not done enough to tame inflation.
One of the things that we've been talking about uh, is possible risk in the financial system as the result of uh, rates remaining elevated for the foreseeable future. One of the reasons maybe that some of the regional banks were hard hit today, given the spike in yield. Are you confident that uh, we have really seen the worst of the stress, maybe that's related to some areas of the commercial real estate market? No, I, I'm certainly not. And I would say that's one of the biggest risks for the economy over the next 12 to 24 months with trillions in commercial loans coming due that are going to reset at significantly higher rates. And so that's going to require a significant amount of capital to right size those loans. Now, that's not to say that can't happen or that commercial real estate is essentially the next shoe to drop. But there is a contagion effect when we talk about this paper, the majority of which is being held on the balance sheet of financial institutions that have less than $250 billion in assets. So th there is still concern about further weakness in the banking sector, although the latest commentary from the Fed does suggest that we're still at very stable conditions as of late. You know, one of the things that Jamie Dimon mentioned in his, his long letter uh, to shareholders was that we may see a structurally higher level of inflation for a considerable period uh, because of some new factors. Um, one might be the geopolitical concerns, the, the wars that are underway, but also the reindustrialization of the American economy uh, and, and some other factors as well. Uh, you know, are you thinking that longer term, you know, we're going to be facing this problem um, you know, for a while. I, I do think it's going to be a longstanding problem. That's not to say, though, that the Fed is going to give up on achieving that 2% goal. Chair Powell was very clear at last month's press conference that 2% is the Fed's target. It's always been the target, and it does remain the target. That being said, longer term, the Fed may be willing to reevaluate that 2% target. And if it does prove to be... in a very onerous uh, achievement, they may be willing to adjust that upwards. But right now, they cannot adjust that mid-cycle without potentially losing control over inflation expectations, which, of course, feed back into the direct inflation calculations. So we talk a lot about uh, the fiscal story as well on this program. And with yields being elevated to the extent that they are today, how much will that hinder the government's effort um, when we're talking about debt service that's going to be uh, increased? I mean, and that's really maybe going to tie the hands of the government in, in trying to do more in, in certain areas of the economy? Well, as we know, debt begets more debt. And with $34 trillion at current levels, we would expect the Treasury to have to massively increase issuance up and down the curve at presumably higher rates to entice investors into the market to buy said debt. But I, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's a negative in terms of controlling further expansion of the government's balance sheet. Because if we do see further expenditures, uh, politics aside, social benefit aside, from the Fed's perspective, that could further potential inflationary implications. Well, given that fiscal largesse uh, that was deemed as pretty necessary because of the pandemic and other factors like the Ukraine war, uh, and also the reindustrialization of the American economy to, to create more jobs for people at home, uh, you know, could you see accepting slightly higher levels of inflation for a period of time, not forever, but for a few years? Well, we've we've already been in a few years of, of above target inflation. So I think at this point, the, the American public is, is going to have <laughs> so a difficult time digesting yeah. further inflation. Yeah. Yeah, it could be enough is enough. Uh, anyway, Lindsay, thank you very much for being with us. Lin Lindsay Piegza there, chief economist at Stiefel, with us live here on the program, taking questions one after the other. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.